Hello, my name's Mark Littlewood. I'm the Director General of the Institute of Economic Affairs. And this video is one of a series of the IEA's webinars, which we've conceived and hosted in order to tackle some of the major issues related to coronavirus. In this video, we'll hear from Patrick Basham, the founding director of the Democracy Institute, a politically independent think tank, and his thoughts on COVID-19, who's to blame, including his analysis of the performance or underperformance of the World Health Organization. It's gonna make fascinating viewing. Hello to everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you today. It's always an honor to be part of any IEA event and to work in concert uh, with Mark. So I really appreciate your interest both in the topic and whatever words and thoughts I have on it. Um, Mark will know because he's uh, suffered through a number of my talks and presentations over the years, that it's, uh, it's a rare event for me to quote Barack Obama in an approving way. But I'm gonna start uh, my formal remarks today by doing just that. Uh, a number of years ago, partway through his presidency, Barack Obama made the, you might say, obvious comment, but really important comment, when he noted that elections have consequences. And they certainly do, and they certainly do for the world right now. And you may be thinking to yourself, well, we're dealing with a pandemic, what does that have to do with elections? Well, my argument to you today in part is that a incredibly underreported election in 2017 is actually pivotal to what we are experiencing now. Uh, there was an election in 2017 for the position of the new Director General of the World Health Organization, the United Nations Public Health Agency. That election was won by a gentleman, uh, Dr. Tedros of Ethiopia. And the reason Dr. Tedros won that election is that he had the crucial support of the Chinese and of other African nations uh, also supported by the Chinese. As I'm sure all of you are aware, uh, China, China is an enormous economic actor in Africa. In Ethiopia, it is an extremely important economic actor and has worked in concert with the Ethiopian government, of which Dr. Tedros was a part for some time. He has served as part of the People's Liberation Front, uh, the left-wing uh, political organization. He has served, had served as foreign minister and as health minister, and was put forward by the Chinese as a would-be head of the World Health Organization, the WHO. Thanks to the Chinese and uh, a lot of Western governments uh, being asleep at the, at the switch, Dr. Tedros won that election in 2017. And I'm gonna to suggest to you now, and hopefully I'll demonstrate over the, the coming minutes, that that election has made a great deal of difference in terms of the situation that we are all facing today. Now, regarding the overall pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, recently, one of the senior WHO spokespeople, not Dr. Tedros, but one of his colleagues, made the point stress that we're, in a, we're all in a very terrible situation. Uh, this is we're not an act of God. I don't think WHO types probably want to uh, ascribe this to God, but there's no blame in this. There is simply no blame. This is something that has happened to all of us, and we simply have to put our shoulders to the wheel and get on with it and do the best thing, best we can. And uh, we'll worry, the historians can, can sort out uh, the, the, the why and the when and the how. I fundamentally, categorically disagree with that notion that there is no blame in this. There, there are two culprits. And I, what I recommend uh, to the broader audience is that we actually award pandemic blame prizes. I think we can do so at this point, and we certainly will be able to uh, when the process is completed. I think there are two prizes. A prize for culpability, culpability goes to the communist regime in China, and a prize for being complicit should go to the World Health Organization. Why is China culpable? I'll summarize that as briefly as I can, because we, I would like to spend most of the time on the complicit actions and inactions of the WHO. But again, as, as most of the audience will be aware, no doubt, China has 
since November through December into January especially, uh, done and not done a number of things which ensured that what was a serious problem within China actually spread beyond the Chinese border. So everything from uh, party officials at the local level in Wuhan, in Hubei province, uh, su suppressing the news, uh, not allowing anyone to find out they hope they thought, particularly their bosses in Beijing, suppression of social media, the persecution of whistleblowers, most of whom, some of whom were journalists, but most of whom were do doctors and other medical people who recognized that people were dying and they were dying of something quite new and that something should be done about it. Uh, what was done about it primarily was those whistleblowers were shut up in all kinds of figuratively and literally. Um, journalists from the West were expelled, Washington Post, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, they were expelled from China because they were digging and digging seriously and finding all kinds of uncomfortable, awkward things about this public health problem that was growing. By, by late December, when we had, by this point, people had been dying for weeks, um, Chinese researchers produced a paper, a, a scientific paper, in which they demonstrated how they had managed to sequence the genome of the uh, coronavirus, meaning that they had been able to sequence the entire DNA. This is, to state the obvious, invaluable material. The Chinese government prevented that paper from being published uh, because of the optics problem they felt for the regime. So it wasn't until the 11th of January that the Chinese government reported publicly the fact that anyone had died in China of this new virus. And since they began reporting and they, beca they began to open up somewhat, very, albeit very slowly, that there was a public health problem going on, the main focus was on deflecting blame. So for example, uh, the Italians were thrown under the bus. This is something that they had done to the Chinese. But the, 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 heaviest, the heaviest hitting was regarding the Americans, where the notion was that American military, the American Navy had somehow brought this um, to the Chinese mainland. Now, so the Chinese were uncooperative, unhelpful, um, negligent, I think it's, it's fair to say, which then leads us to the WHO's role and how they have been complicit. Now, on paper, the WHO is the least political agency at the UN because their mandate is very clear. They are to, as best they can, prevent diseases from happening and especially from spreading, to prepare the world for such an occurrence so that we are at least are in the best position possible to mitigate the effects and to provide the world with the best most reliable evidence-based science and public health advice. Now what I suggest in my paper and what I suggest to you today is that the record of the WHO on this specific issue of the coronavirus is a really, really tragic record, without doubt. And if we go step back a couple of weeks, I said about January 11th, the Chinese went public, yes, someone has died. It was actually the end of December when two things happened on the same day, on, on December 31st, New Year's Eve, which tells us a lot already. It signals the problem we were going to have vis-a-vis -vis the WHO. The Chinese said to the WHO, basically, Geneva, we have a problem. Uh, there's this little local difficulty that we have, and we're not quite sure what's going to happen, but it doesn't look very good. At the same time, the Taiwanese told the WHO, not only is there this problem in China, but we have evidence, definitive evidence, that there is human to human transmission. This thing is contagious. So the WHO, you might assume, took these two pieces of information, you would have assumed, and then communicated those to the world. The WHO chose not to. The WHO chose to be mute and to keep that, those little trivial details to themselves. So this went on for almost two weeks. By the 12th of January, China decides, okay, we can't contain this much more in the public sense, so we're now going to be generous and gracious enough to share 
that sequence genome with the world. The WHO's response, tremendous praise for the Chinese for the speed, as they, as the WHO put it, the speed with which they were communicating their findings to the rest of us. Two days later, mid-January, the WHO announces to the world that there is no evidence of human to human transmission. There's no evidence that this thing, however unfortunate, in one area of China is contagious. This is two weeks after the Taiwanese demonstrated that that was not the case. A week later, the WHO starts to change its tune. It now tells us, well, human to human transmission may be possible, okay, but China can contain it. This is something that is going to stay within the Chinese borders. It may even stay within one province or two. So there's nothing to worry about, okay? That's fine. And the next day, on the 22nd of January, the Chinese quarantined Wuhan, the 11 or 12 million uh, population city manufacturing center, at the epicenter of, of, of the, what will become a pandemic. Ban travel, et cetera, et cetera. Now, internationally, the pressure is starting to mount and people are starting to ask uncomfortable questions to the WHO. The most obvious one is, why haven't you, why aren't you declaring a public health emergency? And some may think, well, a declaration from a UN body, I mean, it's all very nice, but doesn't really mean the thing. Well, actually, it does. Because a declaration of a public health emergency, although not yet at the level of a pandemic declaration, it tells the world, it tells governments, it tells respective public health departments, agencies, organizations, NGOs, etc., that there is real trouble here. And as a consequence, those respective organizations and departments and governments will start taking steps to prepare themselves. Um, on a whole host of fronts, including potential treatments, potential vaccines, etc. But the WHO refuses to declare that emergency, which is an enormous surprise to many in the medical community. The very next day, we start to learn sort of the thinking of the WHO and why they are so hesitant to declare. Well, the main reason that they are hesitant is that the WHO has concluded by the third week of January that this little local public health difficulty in China really isn't going to be much of a problem. The WHO tells us that the, the new virus will be less deadly, less deadly than the SARS virus was back in 2002-2003. And as those of you in the audience may recall, that SARS problem, it ended up killing 774 people, which is very serious. But the, the WHO was convinced that that would outnumber the coronavirus deaths. Now, I checked just before we started the webinar with the Johns Hopkins University site that's tracking the numbers here. And by the time this webinar is over, we're going to be looking at just north of 140,000 deaths globally, 140,000. Now, that is 181 times the number of deaths from the SARS incident, uh, experience in 2003. So the arithmetic and the forecasting skills of the WHO are, to put it mildly, seriously in question. The very next day, the WHO, though, was kind enough to confirm to us that this novel, this new coronavirus does, they can guarantee, exist. Um, and this, of course, uh, was an earth shattering development because by late January, who knew that there was a new virus? Uh, my contacts at the WHO in Geneva tell me that um, if they had more time on the page uh, when they released the press release, they would have also added that the earth is round, they can confirm that. And they also could confirm that we now have men on the moon, but they didn't have rooms. They just had to stick with the fact that yes, there is a new coronavirus. By the 27th, a major report comes out, very unreported. It tells us that the WHO is just fundamentally unprepared for this problem. 
This report by an organization of American doctors who work very much in the disaster preparedness and disaster release, relief uh, side of things, they wanted the world to know that the WHO had not done its due diligence long before it started making these, this series of mistakes, and they simply weren't ready, and therefore the world would not be ready. And this is particularly uh, interesting because it's hard to argue it's a matter of money, because the WHO has decided over recent years to allocate its funds in the most um, surprising way. So yes, they spend money fighting cholera and tuberculosis and AIDS and, and malaria and these other very sort of worthy projects, but they spend more money on travel for their staff than the first class travel, um, penthouse type accommodation travel than they do on these projects. So they were unprepared despite the fact that they're billions of dollars in funding from you and me uh, was sitting there, but they chose to spend it in these surprising ways. Now, things obviously were getting worse and worse and getting more and more publicity. So by the end of the month, by the 30th of January, the, China, uh, the WHO did declare very belatedly, very reluctantly, that there was now, they could confirm a public health emergency going on. But in tandem with that, they made a point and stressed explicitly how much China, how much praise China should receive for her response to date. And this is quite bizarre when you consider how poorly the Chinese behaved on the public health front. But the WHO had, did, to that point, had not, on the 30th of January, did not, and ever since has not, missed an opportunity to praise the Chinese response. The very next day, 31st of January, WHO praises the Chinese for their transparency on this whole issue. Now, one could, with hindsight, say, well, the quarantine the Chinese in, uh, enacted was a good idea. Uh, one can argue these things pro and con in terms of specific instruments the Chinese belatedly enacted. However, I would suggest to you that if there was one word, I, wasn't go I wouldn't immediately associate with the Chinese government, the Chinese president, or the Chinese response to the coronavirus, uh, that would be transparent. That would just not be top of my list. Uh, at the same time, the WHO chose to condemn President Trump's travel ban on China, deciding or de de declaring that this is mo very unuseful, um, unhelpful, and unnecessary. Now we now know, I think it was commonsensical at the time, but we now know from public health experts in America and elsewhere that the travel ban on China uh, is, has saved untold tens of thousands of American lives and was clearly, clearly uh, the best thing that Donald Trump did early on. Uh, it's so obvious the success of the travel ban that his would be opponent for the presidency this year, uh, former Vice President Joe Biden, who initially opposed the ban, now declares his support for it. And his only criticism now is that Trump didn't bring it in soon enough. Now, by early February, the WHO is claiming that they don't know what the source of the virus is. Like geographically, we just don't know. Now, by, by this point, it, is, it, it was well established, or thought it was well established, that the wet markets, those, those wild animal meat markets in China, were the source. Now, there is, just today, Fox News here in America is saying that their sources tell them that it may have been an accidental um, release from a Chinese laboratory. Now, that may turn out to be the case in the same geographic area, but a different specific source. But I suggest to you today that the reason the WHO uh, refused to acknowledge the source of the virus, source of the outbreak, was not because they wanted us to find out it was an accident from the Chinese laboratory. It was actually that they simply did not want to, quote unquote, blame the Chinese. By mid-February, the, uh, the WHO is praising China for having bought the world time with their response. 
researchers so far have found that if the Chinese had only acted three weeks earlier than they did, if they acted in December rather than January, 95% of all of the cases that we've experienced worldwide would not have occurred. By late February, the WHO was telling us there's no such, there's no evidence of community spread. This can be controlled easily. By early March, the WHO is spending time and money to publish a document to tell us that more dangerous than the virus itself is the stigma associated with labeling it a China virus or an Asian virus or a Wuhan virus. So perhaps going forward, we should refer to it as the un-China virus or the un-Wuhan virus. No pandemic declaration into March, which the Chinese respond to with an additional $20, $20 million in, um, in funding. By mid-March, finally, finally, the WHO announces there is a pandemic. It's a four-alarm fire. Everybody's panicked. Now we must do something. So the, to this point, the WHO has pretty much got everything either wrong or refused to acknowledge the truth, has been unhelpful, uh, it, it is, is an atrocious record. And two examples, very recent examples, tell you, I think, that this situation isn't likely to improve. End of the first week in April, the WHO confirmed that North Korea has zero cases. The reason North Korea has zero cases is they don't test anyone, so they can't find anyone who's positive. But the WHO says, no, we're pretty confident North Korea has zero cases. And then um, as, as recently as uh, this week, the WHO has made a point of telling governments around the world that yes, they're aware that British American Tobacco and Philip Morris International are working on a vaccine, but, those, but the governments around the world are not to work with those evil big tobacco representatives, if, even if they come up with a vaccine. So we're seeing once again, politics take precedence over public health. And, I, and so therefore, uh, there's sort of a no shame prize, I think, we could now hand out to the WHO as so a second prize. It's been a catastrophic fail. It's the WHO over the past several months has been worse than useless because they've actually not only not prevented harm, they've actually brought more harm upon us, which is why here in the United States, there is a Senate investigation about to be initiated. Um, it's why people are asking questions such as, should the Director General, Dr. Tredros, be removed? It's why Donald Trump says we're going to freeze American funding, but raising the question, should we defund the WHO or should we just reform it somehow? Is there a way of changing the players, somehow changing the furniture enough uh, that the situation can be improved? Or should we replace the WHO? Should the UN take it out and, bring, and, and, and enact, initiate a new body to do the same job, but actually do that job and cause no harm at the very least. Or lastly, my personal favorite would be for competition for the WHO. I suspect the WHO uh, cannot be salvaged, cannot be saved. So what about philanthropists, corporations, et cetera, around the world funding a competitor to the WHO that it can have the identical mandate, but it can actually do the job, actually have a bottom line, uh, a financial bottom line, but more importantly, a bottom line in terms of the, uh, the, the, the work it does and the record that it has to stand behind. Uh, without that kind of uh, critique, we are simply going to have more of the same. And as we've seen in the WHO's response to President Trump's uh, call for a, for, for a freeze on American funding, uh, there is no desire to change, uh, no will to change. And the assumption I believe on the part of the current WHO folks is that if the American money goes away, the Chinese and others will simply fill in the gaps and the WHO will continue to do its work in Geneva, in its comfortable uh, environment, and the rest of us will simply have to put up with it. Um, I've taken already a great deal of your time. I appreciate you watching initially and then 
more to the point, listening to my remarks, and I look forward to any questions or comments you may have. Patrick, thank you very much. We've got a whole um, stream of questions already in, and I'm gonna try and um, batch them together, and I've got one or two myself. I might add those on in as supplementary, so I'm not gonna take these quite in the order that they're on the screen, because I think some of them um, uh, directly relate to some of the issues that you raise. Some of them are, are looking for um, further explanation. So I'm actually going to start with a question from Nico uh, Averu. I hope I pronounced your name correctly there, Nico. He actually says, could you please explain the governance structure of the WHO? How are decisions made? You didn't say this explicitly, Patrick, but um, uh, but the your sort of suggestion is they're sort of it largely now in hot to the Chinese government that the Chinese were important in this electoral process. That some of their actions seem to have been more in the kind of narrow political interests of the Chinese Communist Party than necessarily wider public health concerns. I at least took that. Uh, I was. Uh, I took that as um, what you were inferring. But just tell us a little about how it is structured. I mean, why was the West asleep at the wheel for this election? I mean, more fool us, right? Yeah. Well. The, uh, on paper, on the chart, on the blackboard, as it were, the WHO operates as uh, a sort of council of experts. You know, you're talking about the best and the brightest in the public health field. Uh, they have a, you know, they have a board, uh, member countries, not all countries are members. Um, so, for example, and this is actually quite important in, the, in this context, the Taiwanese, Taiwan is not a member organization of the WHO. You say, well, doesn't Taiwan want to have good public health? Uh, yes, the problem for Taiwan is that the WHO won't let her in. They won't let her in because the Chinese won't let the WHO let her in. Uh, China being not the largest, America is, but one of the larger and in growing in its uh, uh, contributions to the WHO. So the WHO is uh, apparently an organization that simply sifts through the best data, uh, does research, does, does do important work. There are many good people at WHO. The problem is that as in any bureaucratic organization, when it comes to decision-making and unfortunately decision-making on the most important issues, the decisions are likely to have a political flavor to them. And what has happened to the WHO, certainly in recent years, is it has become politicized. Now, you know, a, a topic for a very different um, environment, you know, that has been going on a long time on various topics. But clearly, since 2017 and Dr. Tedros's election, the WHO has become very sympathetic, shall we, to put it euphemistically, to the Chinese position on many or any of these issues. So the world is not privy to what is going on within the WHO. Yes, they are coming out most days and telling us the great things they are doing and batting back any questions about favoritism towards China, et cetera, et cetera. But they are not accountable. There is a, they are as, an, as accountable as any UN agency is to the rest of us, that is those who actually pay their salaries and pay for the work that they do, which means they are completely unaccountable, right? And the reason for that is that our governments, those who, in the case of certainly most Western nations, foot most of the bill, do not hold their feet to the fire. Uh, President Trump, for all his faults, appears to want to do that, uh, which is why, along with the criticism, he's also receiving a lot of support, because it appears to be the first time that anyone wants to say, is the WHO, which on paper is a great idea perhaps, is it actually doing the work that it's supposed to, and is it doing it well? Uh, a couple of um, members of our audience are going to take these two together. Uh, one of our uh, audience members asked, how could the World Health Organization be unprepared for this such an event? What else would they do apart from planning a plan for mobilizing the World Health Community in the event of public health emergencies? I mean, this should be the sort of one moment they've spent years to spring into action. And then slightly attached to that, because I'm interested in uh, picking away at... Um, the sort of what institutional reform we want. We can point to a whole list of uh, failures on the part of the personnel here and, uh, and, and possible sort of um, uh, perverse incentives in closing up to the Chinese. But how, how do we change it? And you did in your remarks uh, suggest maybe philanthropists or corporations would need to step up to the plate in some way. 
you touched on that, but another audience member asks, what form do you think international cooperation on pandemics should take, if not the WHO? You know, what's your structure? How would you build an institutional framework, either in the private sector or the public sector or a mix, but wouldn't uh, have a propensity or a tendency to run into these uh, sort of problems and inefficiencies, oversights, or malpractice, even if you're suggesting that? So. It is shocking. It is starting. How is this possible? The only way it's possible is that those running the operation, oh, I don't doubt that they care about public health, but they clearly don't care enough. So they have, as have so many government bureaucracies around the world over the centuries, argu arguably, um, fallen prey to the situation where their own self-interest, their own material self-interest takes precedence. So it's about a nice staff, it's about nice travel, it's about uh, grandiose projects. It's not about the fundamentals. It is not about preparing us. It's not about prevention. Um, that it is simply too many people for whom the, num who, for whom the mission statement is boilerplate. It's not something that they live and breathe every day. They, they may at one point have been passionate about public health, but they don't act professionally any longer as if they are. Um, in terms of institutional framework, I tend to think that uh, we are going to see, well, we, we actually need to see this probably more on a nation by nation, or at least continent by continent basis. Because if we go global, we're likely potentially to fall into the same trap. Now, if it is private money, I'm not saying necessarily corporate, if it's corporate or philanthropical sources of money, then you are more, far more likely to have it someone say at some point, okay, what are we actually getting for our money here? Is it worth it? And I, so I do think that perhaps competition is better. Although it's tempting to say, you know, push the WHO off a cliff and be done with it. If we have competition, I think it will actually demonstrate uh, beyond anything else, how poorly they've performed on the pandemic when, they, when we actually see how a decently run, organized, uh, funded organization operates in the same sphere. Uh, I've got a question now from Matt Ridley. Good to have you with us as always, uh, Matt. He, he wants to question a little bit, um, you putting so much emphasis on the 2017 election that nobody had heard, had heard of, but that you now think might be pivotal. Matt's question is as follows. The poor performance of the World Health Organization in 2014 to 15 over the Ebola epidemic, as whose internal review itself concluded in 2015, might imply that the 2017 election of Tedros was not as crucial as Patrick implies. Margaret Chan, the, the predecessor, was prone to some pretty strange priorities. Would Navarro have definitely been better? Or is it the problem that who is actually institutionally problematic? You were putting quite a lot of weight around that election, but I mean, did it really matter that much? Or do you have, have a, a problem? You know, is the problem institutional rather than about the personnel? I'm, I'm always very tempted to go with a systemic, you know, inherent institutional cause. And there's no question that just as there is today, I think serious rot uh, within the, the, the architecture, the framework of the WHO, there was and has been for some time. So I agree completely with Matt on that. What I would suggest, and we can debate whether it's a matter of degree or of kind, what I would suggest is that Dr. Tedros's election made a bad situation, that is the general um, um, modus operandi of the WHO made a bad situation that much worse. And I can't say, and I would be the last person to suggest that if only Dr. Chan had been in charge or everything would have been better. I, I don't think it would have been very good, but I think we do know for a fact that Ted Ross's election and his relationship with the Chinese um, took things to a new level, that is a, a, a bad new level. Um, so again, we can debate the, the, the specifics and the WHO has been on a downward trajectory for some time. So it's a very, it's a very valid point, but an exclamation mark at the very least, I think, has been put on the performance by Tedros subsequent to his election in 2017. Okay, I'll just, pay, uh, Peter Lloyd's just uh, chipped in as well. It's really a comment rather than a question, but he says, if you look at the nominally controlling body, the World Health Assembly, you can see the governance problem in front of your eyes right there. Do you think that's a, an issue? The, the, the normally controlling body or the oversight of it? Is, is, is that really where, if you like, yeah, the meta no, blame lies? No, no, no one's taking enough interest. Or should I say, 
there are plenty of organizations, governments taking an interest, but they're taking an interest um, in, in a way that we wouldn't like. They're taking an interest because they see benefit to the WHO vis-a-vis -vis their own situation, right? because the WHO is turning a blind eye, the WHO is parroting their, uh, their, their uh, deceptive line, or the WHO is funding uh, things that they don't want funded. Those who I think have, uh, the, those the better angels among us are not, have not been taking sufficient interest. And so the rot has, has really crept in and has taken on momentum of its own as it will. Uh, it just, there just has not been a light shone on the WHO. We have to remember here the optics are really important. The WHO, you know, is an American sense, it's very much motherhood and apple pie. I mean, who is going to say that these, these wonderful people, these experts, aren't doing good things or don't have good intentions. It's very, very hard to find a politician until very recently who will say, wait a second, maybe everything isn't rosy in the WHO garden. Okay, uh, thanks for that. I'm gonna to clump together three questions which are, which are linked. They're all um, from uh, anonymous, uh, they're all anonymized, so I'll just read them out as I see them here. Uh, first one, very simple, who funds who? What's the present breakdown look like? Um, slightly attached to that is the question, uh, another question that says, this isn't the first time the World Health Organization has been found wanting on its primary role. Is the US withdrawing funding sufficient to bring about real change this time? Or is there more that has to be done to help us get the type of World Health Organization or a different setup to the one you've described that we all want? Should other countries put more funding and follow uh, the Trump administration lead? Or is some different root and branch change needed? So. Uh, you've been, you've, you've suggested each, you've sort of suggested President Trump might have got it right, but on the other hand, you might want a, a whole new structure. So what's the funding breakdown like, and, and how important is this um, uh, removal of, of American funding? And then the third question uh, from one of our audience is, how did the World Health Organization become so China central? Can it, can it realistically ever now cover the confidence of other nation states? Uh, the WHO is funded in two ways. It's funded from sort of compulsory contributions uh, from uh, member states, uh, uh, basically, you know, the same folks who, who fund the UN and in the way they fund the UN, and also in voluntary contributions. So countries may decide to top up their mandatory contribution. So right now, and it's been the case over the past several years, the United States is not the majority funder, but is uh, the principal funder. So out of a couple of billion, you're talking several hundred um, million uh, from the United States. I think the United Kingdom is actually the second highest at a per capita rate that's something like twice what the American, maybe even higher than that. Uh, the UK really does give a lot of money uh, to the WHO. The Chinese are uh, sort of five, six on the list. They've been coming up. Uh, spending more and more money, getting more and more bang for their buck, they believe. That's why, and as I touched on in my earlier remarks, uh, no de declaration of a pandemic coincidentally, you know, added $20 million to the WHO's coffers. Um, so it's, it's, it's China and Western countries, the principal Western countries, Western Europe and North America, who make up most of the funding. Um, in terms of what happens when the fund, if the funding goes away? I mean, I'm gonna have a caveat here on Donald Trump and his, um, which I think is sensible to say we should freeze spending. Uh, Donald Trump is, what, a classic move of Donald Trump is to make a radical or quote unquote extreme proposal and then move in closer to what he's happy to go away with. What may happen here is the US may either temporarily take money away or not give the next dollop of money, or it may simply accept that the WHO is going to change her ways. And what that will mean is that Trump will, will want and will think he's achieved the WHO's ear and attention, and that the US will now have a bigger say uh, because the WHO knows that its principal funder could go away at any time. Um, in terms of where the money could, else, could come from, the Chinese certainly, depending obviously on their economic recovery, uh, um, the, there, there are a number of countries who could fill in the gap, but it will be hard because you know, the WHO supporters tend to be the poorer countries, um, those who I think increasingly feel the WHO isn't doing the work she's, she's mandated uh, to do are the richer ones who give most of the money. So the WHO is, is saying everything will be fine if we lose the American money. That's not necessarily the case. Um, and of course, 
Could they do more with less? Maybe, but they don't have, the track record doesn't suggest so. In fact, the, uh, just last week, the WHO said, we'd like a billion more, please. Um, one off, but we need more money to do more of the good things that, that we do. Uh, one of our guests actually asks whether what's gone wrong here is um, uh, more cock up than conspiracy, I guess that you could say. Um, that um, the World Health, Health Organization's legitimately relies on international health regulations, uh, which are based on the international sanitary regulations, which require countries to notify the World Health Organization of any diseases. Uh, so first point, the Chinese thought they could contain it, but then realized their mistake. However, the concept of, I can't even pronounce this in Chinese, Mianzu, is it called, not losing face, is very important to Chinese culture. So perhaps the health organization doesn't want to be too critical of China, uh, since it will need their cooperation to report diseases in the future, as well as some of their money. Um, also attached to the, the, what you make of that, on the theory of conspiracy theories or not, so that this suggestion is it was a cock up, not conspiracy, What's the likelihood, you referenced this uh, Fox News thing, uh, that the virus was created in a laboratory? Is this valid speculation or is it a conspiracy theory? So do you have, first one, do you have some sympathy with the World Health Organization and having to get on with the Chinese uh, rather than just sort of calling them out? Uh, and secondly, uh, uh, again, a conspiracy theory theme, what do you think of the suggestion this might have been a lab experiment, not a wet market that led to the problem? Right. Well, I'm dealing with the Chinese. I mean, one has to be sympathetic to any organization or government that has to deal with the regime in Beijing, of course. However, and this is the larger question of WHO dealing with China and the defunding of the WHO. The, the response is, is this is the, the, the pushback. The pushback is it's bad timing. You have to deal with the Chinese if things are going to work, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if this was six months ago, I, I take that on board far more than I do today, because we'd be saying, yes, the Chinese are difficult, and yes, the WHO isn't perfect, they've had some serious problems, but they need to have this relation, the nature of the relationship as they see fit, because it's the only way we ensure that bad things don't happen. The China is just too important. Okay. The problem is, for that argument, we're not dealing in the abstract of the theoretical, the hypothetical. We're dealing today with a global pandemic that didn't probably didn't have to be one. It was a legitimate, serious public health crisis within China. Thanks to the Chinese and thanks to the WHO and thanks especially to their relationship, we went from public health crisis in China to global pandemic. Now, if that isn't evidence that this cozy relationship doesn't work for the rest of us. I don't know what is. So I, I, you know, I think the horse is bolted on that one. It, it, we have the, uh, sufficient. We have we have sufficient proof. I don't know, you know, the audience mem uh, members' experiences, but I think many of us, uh, when the things started to kick off in in January, etc., uh, you'd hear individuals say something conspiratorial sounding about what the Chinese may or may not have been up to. And the first reaction, the logical reaction, is to kind of dismiss that, or at least, you know, put it aside. Uh, and there has been pretty good evidence that the wet markets uh, are, were, were the source. Now, where the caveat comes in is that this new Fox News story, it is very well sourced. And it isn't suggesting that the Chinese did this to us. It's suggesting that, if true, if this was an accidental, you know, this, this, was a, this was an accident that occurred. Uh, in Wuhan, and you know the rest is history. Now we don't know yet whether that may be true, but I think common sense tells us that if that was true, then it makes it even more logical that the Chinese covered up as much as they did, right? Um, the wet market may have been unforgivable in some quarters as the source of the outbreak, but the laboratory tests source of outbreak uh, for most people would be that much more unforgivable. Okay. Um, uh, one of our audience says, you started the presentation saying the World Health Organization is on paper the least political part of the UN. Are there any parts of the UN that we should consider are doing the role they're meant to be carrying out in a proper and neutral way? And somewhat attached to that, a question from Eric Blumquist. Um, hi, Eric. Are any of the UN agencies mostly focused on their primary original task, 
or have indeed most of them been captured by various focused interest groups diverted into more fashionable political causes. So is this the nature of the beast within the UN or is the World Health Organization an outlier that's sort of gone wrong for some reason or is this just what we can expect of all UN agencies? What's the wider picture to us? Well, my answer to the first question is no. My answer to the second question is yes. Uh, mm -hmm. there, the, U, the WHO is, I do not believe, an outlier. Uh, there aren't, no UN agencies come to mind as doing uh, great work as uh, pres prescribed in their mission. Um, the WHO is just the latest example to be publicized. It has gone, went off the rails a while ago, as some of the questions and comments have suggested. Uh, but the UN, uh, whatever purpose it may have served, it no longer serves that purpose, I think it's, I would suggest to the audience. Uh, and individual agencies uh, are, you know, uh, exhibit A's, B's through Z of that. Um, it is a politicized institution and it has become, uh, crudely stated, it has become an institution that gives um, dictatorial regimes around the world and uh, sort of wannabe dictators an excuse to criticize, critique, and try to take down a peg or two um, the leading Western nations who coincidentally are the ones who fund it. So I think going forward, what we could hope for is that the funding issue for the UN generally is called into question as a result of WHO type debacles. And that means that if those who love the UN and think it has utility, go forward with it and fund it, great. But those who don't, don't continue to fund it and either keep their money or spend it elsewhere on, as I say, in the case of the WHO, perhaps a competitor. Uh, one of our audience members asked, uh, as the countries of the EU are big sufferers, why is there no apparent complaint from Brussels uh, along the lines that you've been uh, complaining uh, 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 about? Where, where, where is the uh, Brussels uh, machine here? Somebody else asked, why haven't these sort of problems in the World Health Organization been exposed by the media or media organizations such as the BBC? And then John May asks, um, uh, should those countries with governments which espouse global free markets not now step up to the plate and take more of an influential role in preventing the gerrymandering of these supranational organizations? Otherwise, we'll continue to rail against these bureaucracies. Is there a sort of obligation here rather than just being um, asleep at the wheel? And uh, I'm just finding the very last question that we'll be able to uh, put forward is a question about... Um, uh, whether, well, uh, Nima Pavani asks, what's the EU position vis-a-vis -vis China and WHO does it stand? That's a bit like the question about why Brussels has criticized the Chinese. But another question, I can't find it just here now, but I recall it, was uh, how much can we actually trust the numbers coming out of China? If the picture that you've painted is one of dissembling or not uh, coming forward in a transparent basis early enough, you know, or should we just almost disregard the numbers of uh, fatalities um, and deaths? So sort of Brussels and the media, why aren't they talking in the terms that you are asking these sort of uh, questions? Can we trust the Chinese? And what's the obligation on free market nations to really do something about this problem being asleep at the wheel again? Well, I think we need to take a very business-like approach to this. You know, what are we getting for our money? Uh, there's no reason to uh, start from a position that, that we cannot get good value from a public health agency, whether it's at the local, national, or international level. Uh, my point is simply, but I think uh, crucially, that the WHO is not fulfilling that mandate. So let's apply as much rational cost-benefit analysis as we can, and let's go forward saying, yes, there are going to be public health issues that we either now recognize we're facing or we may face in the future. We, yes, we need to invest to be prepared for them, but let's do it in a way and with people um, and with groups that have a track record of success and who don't have an obvious political agenda. I mean, when you're never going to find in any field completely objective people, but you can find independent-minded people. Uh, the WHO 
clearly is not independent minded in a political sense. So we need to do something different. We need to do something better. And I'm just going to finish because I think it would be very unfair on Edgar Warner, who was the first person to actually put a question in the question box if I don't take his. Uh, this isn't specifically on uh, the World Health Organization or the institutional structures, but he asked, how would you feel, how do you feel about the proposal from Google and Apple to develop a system through our smart hosts that alerts us to contacts we may have had with infected people? Uh, Edgar concedes, I would normally be aghast about this invasion of privacy, but being 83, I would certainly sign up to it. And uh, an, another question comes from Anthony St. Hill about how we can combat the uh, virus. Given that the global spread of the virus is largely carried between and within continents by travelers on aircraft, why haven't the American airlines been grounded to the same extent internally as international domestic airlines elsewhere until such a time as adequate screening of travelers is in place at airport? I think it largely comes down to the lobbying power of the aviation industry in America. Uh, they just had another 20 billion in terms of um, rescue slash bailout money. Uh, they've been able to convince the powers that be uh, that they do need to keep flying to some extent. Um, and you know, we can argue that that is an underreaction on the part of the, the government here, you know, where in other areas there may have been an overreaction. But I think sure. it is largely politics. Uh, in terms of the first question, I mean, I, I, I share the questioner's um, concern. It's, it's, it's perhaps it may prove to be one of the classic trade-offs. You know, do, are we willing to trade what apparently is a benefit of technology that may really be able to help us of track and trace, which I think is so essential to overcoming this problem and live, survivability and living with it, um, the, uh, but accept that the trade-off is access and information and data to those who, uh, without you know, picking on any particular company, uh, do not necessarily have the greatest track record of, of looking after our privacy um, and our personal information. It, it's, it, it's an unanswerable question in the sense that there is no good choice. There is no perfect choice, not even a good choice. It's, it's the, the lesser of two evils, I think, really. So thank you very much again for joining us for this video. Just a reminder, if you'd like to read Patrick's paper about the World Health Organization in full, you can find that paper on the Democracy Institute's website. That's www.democracyinstitute.org. To keep up to date with the IEA and our video and podcast series, if you would uh, like to subscribe to our channel, you can do so by hitting the bell on YouTube down in the bottom right. That will keep you informed. Uh, of all of the upcoming videos. In audio only, you can listen to us on Podbean. And if you visit the IEA's website, www.iea.org.uk, you can also sign up for our free daily newsletter bulletin, which will keep you abreast of the news, the IEA's reaction to it, and more webinars, seminars, and broadcasts like this one. Thanks again for joining us.